I would like to look with you at some of the material from the 14th century. Up until the 14th century, we find a scattered references to the practice of the invocation of the Holy Name. But it cannot be said that it is a central theme in all spiritual texts throughout the Christian East. As I mentioned, there are important authors, uh, one of them, St. Simeon, the new theologian himself, who do not refer explicitly to the Jesus prayer. But in the 14th century, the Jesus prayer comes to occupy the center of the stage and continues to do so in the centuries that follow. Also in the 14th century, the tradition of the invocation of the Holy Name is incorporated much more closely into the fabric of theology as a whole. Now, I would like to look at four developments this afternoon. First of all, in the late uh, 13th and early 14th century, there emerges clearly into the open a particular physical technique linked with the saying of the Jesus Prayer. A technique that involves in particular control of the breathing, the linking of the tempo of the prayer with the rhythm of the respiration. So let us first look then at the so-called hesychast method. Paul in 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, Glorify God in your body. Prayer is to be not simply a mental activity. It is to involve the whole of our person including our physicality. But how in practice is this to be done? Now, certain early Christian writers do make passing allusions to the breathing. But it is not clear how far these references are to be taken literally. St. Gregory the Theologian, for example, says, Remember God more often than you breathe. Now, I do not think he intends to refer to any particular technique linking prayer to our breathing. It seems more... Uh, convincing to say he is just using a metaphor. He's just saying in vivid terms what St. Paul says, remember God all the time, pray without ceasing. Prayer should be as much a natural part of our life as breathing is. But then, when we come on to St. John Climacus, we come across what could be a more definite reference. Climacus, in the 7th century, in his Ladder of Divine Ascent, says, Let the remembrance of Jesus be united with your breathing. Now that's rather more specific. And his follower, St. Hesychius, says, let the Jesus prayer cleave to your breathing. <clears throat> Did 
Hesychius and Climacus have in mind a particular technique here. It isn't clear, we don't know. If they did, they don't tell us in any detail what it was. But if we turn to the Coptic tradition, and the Jesus prayer is found in Coptic Christianity as in Greek Christianity, the evidence becomes rather more definite in the Coptic cycle of texts concerning St. Macarius. The material is hard to date with precision. It could come from the 7th or the 8th centuries. Here we find phrases like these. How easy it is to say with every breath, My Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. I bless you. My Lord Jesus Christ, help me. And then again it says, um, Be attentive to the name of our Lord Jesus Christ with a contrite heart. Make it flow from your lips and draw it back to you. None of this is very precise, but it does seem to involve more than mere metaphor. There does seem to be a connection affirmed between breathing in and breathing out. Now, we have to wait several more centuries before anything as explicit as this is <coughs> found in the Greek tradition. And the first author in whom this is definitely found is the person whose text has been distributed to you um, Saint Nikiforos the Hesychast I'm looking for my own copy no I want my own copy which is annotated and I don't quite know where that's got um, here we are yes look uh, it's worth reading the whole of Nikiforos' text. It's a kind of anthology of earlier writings. But I'd like you to turn in particular to page 204 and 205. And the text you have from you before you is from volume 4 of the English Philokalia. Um, Nikiforos, at the top of page 205, uh, says that we should search for an unerring guide, so that under his instruction we may learn how to deal with the shortcomings and exaggerations suggested to us by the devil whenever we deviate left or right from the axis of attentiveness since uh, such a guide will himself have been tested through what he has suffered he will be able to make these things clear to us and will unambiguously disclose the spiritual path to us so that we can follow it easily if however you have no such guide, you should search diligently for one. If, however, no guide is to be found, you must renounce worldly attachments, call on God with a contrite spirit and with tears, and do what I tell you. And then he goes on briefly to describe a breathing technique. Now this is interesting. Nikiforos recommends the breathing technique as something that we should adopt if we can't find a spiritual guide. Modern teaching on this subject is completely different. In modern teaching it's said you shouldn't try any breathing techniques, certainly not any elaborate techniques, 
unless you've got a personal spiritual guide who can watch over you. If you haven't got an experienced guide, don't try them. So this is a difference between the attitude of Nikiforos in the 14th century and the attitude of most modern spiritual fathers, particularly in the Russian tradition. Then Nikiforos continues, you know that what we breathe is air. When we exhale it, it is for the heart's sake, for the heart is the source of life and warmth for the body. Notice here the concentration on the heart. Nikifara stands in the tradition which regards the heart as the center of the human person, not the head. The heart draws towards itself the air inhaled when breathing in, so that by discharging some of the heat when the air is exhaled, it may maintain an even temperature. This is a physiology that we might find somewhat outdated, but Nikiforos didn't invent it. This is found quite widely in the classical world that the heart has to be maintained at an even temperature. And so when we breathe in, the air goes down our lungs to the heart. It cools the heart down. When we breathe out, the air comes out warm. And this means that the heart is cooled down, is not overheated. Once I was watching a television program about crocodiles and I recall that the crocodiles sitting in the heat of Egypt open their mouths very wide breathe in deeply and close them so evidently the crocodiles practice this kind of breathing <laughs> to keep themselves cool but whether they are saying the Jesus prayer the program didn't <coughs> recount. The cause of this process, or rather its agent, are the lungs. The Creator has made these capable of expanding and contracting like bellows, so that they can easily draw in and expel their contents. Thus, by taking in coolness and expelling heat, through breathing, the heart performs unobstructed the function for which it was created, that of maintaining life. So that's the physiological background. And then the exact details, though they're not very exact, about what we are to do. <coughs> Seat yourself then. That's the first thing. Sit down when saying the Jesus prayer. This is unusual. In the ancient world, you normally stood to pray. So the idea that you sit when praying is unusual in the ancient texts. But it's normal in the teaching about the Jesus prayer. Uh, other 14th century writers say you should sit on a low stool about 10 inches high and that is still done on Mount Athos and elsewhere that means you adopt a kind of crouching position uh, which can prove highly uncomfortable I usually suggest to people that they shouldn't at the beginning try sitting on a low stool that you should simply sit on a chair with a back, but perhaps without arms. And of course you don't cross your legs. You would never pray with the legs crossed. Seat yourself then, concentrate your intellect, that's your noose. Lead it into the respiratory passage 
through which your breath passes into your heart. Put pressure on your intellect and compel it to descend with your inhaled breath into your heart. Once it has entered there, what follows will be neither dismal nor glum. Just as a man after being far away from home on his return is overjoyed at being with his wife and children again, so the intellect, once it is united with the soul, is filled with indescribable delight. So that's the basic technique, that you make your intellect descend with your breath down your lungs to the place of the heart and in this way the intellect and the heart are united but Nicky Forrest doesn't give very many details about this it's a rather general description now there's another text that also speaks about the physical technique and this is a text attributed to St. Simeon the New Theologian. And I don't think you have that with you, do you? No. But um, that I can just summarize for you. This is St. Simeon the New Theologian attributed. And it goes under various titles, but the most common is on the three methods of prayer. Now, that is also to be found in volume four of the English Philokalia. Look it up under pages 72 to 73. Now, it's generally thought this is not by Simeon. Some people think that it's possibly by Nikiforos himself. I think this is unproven because it's slightly different, though similar to what Nikiforos says. Um, it could be rather earlier than Nikiforos. It could, some of the manuscripts where it's found might be 13th or even 12th century. Anyway, this is what is said in this further text. Um, sit down in a quiet cell, in a corner by yourself, and do what I tell you. Close the door. Withdraw your intellect from everything worthless and transient. Rest your beard on your chest. So this is a bowed posture. And focus your physical gaze, together with the whole of your intellect, upon the center of your belly or your navel. Now this is unusual. The other texts speak of concentrating your attention on the heart, not on the belly. Restrain the drawing in of breath through the nostrils so as not to breathe easily and search inside yourself with your intellect so as to find the place of the heart where all the powers of the soul reside. There you have the idea of the heart as the spiritual center of the total person. To start with, you will find there darkness and an impenetrable density. Later, when you persist and practice this task day and night, you will find, as though miraculously, an unceasing joy. This is what we've already seen in Nikiforos, the emphasis upon joyful. For as soon as the intellect attains the place of the heart, at once it sees things of which it previously knew nothing. 
It sees the open space within the heart, and it beholds itself entirely luminous and full of discernment. This is again what the Adicus talks about, the experience of the light of the intellect. Notice the phrase, the open space within the heart. We today probably think in terms of the circulation of the blood, and we think of the heart as a pump. In the ancient world, the circulation of the blood was not widely understood. And the normal view of the heart was that it was an, em an empty vessel, that there was empty space within the heart. And so... When you enter into the heart, you find yourself in a spacious, empty place. I think the Macarian homilies use the phrase, the prairies of the heart, or the pastorages of the heart. When I went to Canada, to Edmonton, I was struck by enormous flat plains all around the city. Huge open space the prairies and that's how it's like when you go into the heart there's lots of room in there it's a spacious domain so it sees the open space within the heart and it beholds itself entirely luminous and full of discernment from then on from whatever side a distractive thought may appear before it has come to completion and assumed a form the intellect immediately drives it away and destroys it with the invocation of Jesus Christ. It sounds as if the process of making your intellect enter the heart is a preliminary exercise and that only when you've got inside the heart do you start actually saying the Jesus prayer. From this point onwards, the intellect begins to be full of rancor against the demon and rousing its natural anger against its noetic enemies, it pursues them and strikes them down. The rest you will learn for yourself with God's help, by keeping God over your intellect and by retaining Jesus in your heart. As the saying goes, sit in your cell and your cell will teach you everything. That's from the apothegmat of the sayings of the Desert Father. Now, that is similar to Nikiforos, but not exactly the same. And again, it isn't very precise. Um, the physical technique is next mentioned by a very influential author in the early 14th century, a little later than Nikiforos, St. Gregory of Sinai, who died in 1346 and was on Mount Athos in the later part of his life. Um, now, he nowhere directly quotes Nikiforos. It doesn't seem that he had met him, but he may have known these two works. And he stresses that in particular that we are to breathe slowly that's another part of the technique not to breathe as you would expect normally to do but to slow down the rhythm of your breathing um, and I think uh, the text attributed to Simeon has something of the same idea, Restore, restrain the drawing in of breath through your nostrils, so as not to breathe easily. And then a fourth author who speaks about the physical technique, or two authors, are St. Callistos and St. Ignatius Granthopoulos. Reu Sinai is in volume four of the Philocalia, St. Callistos and St. Ignatius wrote a hundred chapters which form a kind of vademecum to hesychasm 
they were right at the end of the 14th century, a very beautiful work. That has not yet been included in the new edition of the Philokalia, um, uh, so uh, that will be in volume five when, God willing, that appears. And uh, if you want to read this work by Callistos Indignatios, you have to go to the older English translation, uh, Writings from the Philokalia on Prayer of the Heart, made by um, uh, Evgenia Katlubovsky and Gerald Palmer. But that translation is made from the Russian, not directly from the Greek. Now, in, I think, Callistos and Ignatius, one has more clearly the idea that the breathing should be related to the rhythm of the prayer. And that's also to be found in Gregory of Sinia. So let's sum up the physical technique. It has three elements. First, bodily posture. Sit on a stool. Secondly, control the rhythm of your breathing. Breathe more slowly. Relate the prayer to the rhythm of the breathing. And there are various ways of doing that. The simplest is to say the first half of the prayer as you breathe in. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, and the second half as you breathe out, have mercy on me, the sinner. And then thirdly, along with the control of the breathing, you are to practice inner exploration, concentrating on different psychosomatic centers thinking of the intellect descending with the breath down the lungs into the place of the heart. Now, what are we to make of all this? Nikiforos, as I mentioned, said, this is what you must do if you can't find a spiritual father. Gregory Palamas says that this uh, form of breathing technique is suited especially for beginners and that when you've advanced further you won't need to use a technique. But the modern view is be very careful with this physical exercise. Don't use it unless you have an experienced spiritual father to guide you. And this is the view taken by the Russian spiritual masters in the 19th century by Saint Ignaty Bryanchaninov and Saint Theophan the Recluse. Um, Ignaty Bryanchaninov says, for example, this teaching of the fathers has caused and continues to cause difficulty to many readers. We advise our beloved brethren not to try to discover this mechanism within them if it does not reveal itself with its own accord. Many wishing to learn it by experience have damaged their lungs and gained nothing. And Theophan is also quite critical of it. And in his Russian translation of the Philokalia, uh, Theophan omitted these passages that I've been quoting or he greatly abbreviated them but today if you're making a translation that's not an acceptable technique modern standards we are expected to translate literally what is there so there is considerable reserve about this technique today. Don't use it unless you have a spiritual guide. 
And in fact, you see, the texts are not very precise or clear. And a lot of the teaching about the physical technique is only handed down orally. And it still continues to be handed down on the Holy Mountain, but it's not put in writing. A second point to keep in mind is that the breathing technique is in no way obligatory. Sometimes people talk about it as constituting the hesychast method of prayer. But it isn't the, the method of prayer. It's only proposed as an aid that may be helpful to some but is in no way compulsory. You can practice the Jesus prayer in its integrity without any physical technique at all. It's just an optional aid. The third thing to bear in mind is, and you may think I'm being a bit paranoid, but I will nonetheless say it, the mechanism of our breathing is a very delicate thing. You breathe all right, unless you've got emphysema, you breathe without thinking about it. But once you start thinking about how you're breathing and you start tinkering the way you breathe, the consequences may be rather alarming. There is another slightly related technique that is described in the way of a pilgrim, where you relate the Jesus prayer not to the rhythm of the breathing but to the beating of the heart now the 14th century text familiar to me say nothing about linking the Jesus prayer with the beating of the heart and I would strongly recommend you not to try that in Sufism however the invocation of the holy name is often linked with the heart beating. Some of you may know a book that came out some time ago uh, by Salinger called Franny and Zoe. And uh, Franny has read a little pea green covered book called The Way of a Pilgrim and she starts trying to practice the Jesus prayer as the pilgrim did using a physical technique and she finds it's all very upsetting and her boyfriend is quite skeptical about it all he says all this synchronization business and mumbo jumbo you will get heart trouble and you do so one has to be careful here. There might be no harm in using a breathing technique under spiritual guidance, but we shouldn't embark on these things ill-advisedly. But St. Gregory Palamas, in particular, defends the use of the physical technique. It was attacked by a certain Varan, a learned Greek monk from South Italy and he like Franny's boyfriend said all this mumbo jumbo he had evidently heard about this technique from rather ignorant monks who gave him a misleading picture of it and he said that the hesychasts were grossly superstitious in practicing this method and thinking that you could get vision of divine light in this way. Well, um, Palamas came to the defense of the prayer and he said, it rests on a sound theology of the human person. We are a unity of body and soul. We should be using our body in prayer and this is one way of harnessing the energies of the body to the work of prayer. But he didn't think that this technique was particularly important. He thought it was defensible, but not to be overemphasized. But he accepts the principle that, in his own words, our inner being naturally adapts itself to outer forms. 
Now, modern readers have been fascinated by this technique because of the parallels that exist with yoga and, and Sufism. And the parallels are certainly very striking. I won't go into them now, but there are the same things in yoga, the recommendation of particular postures, control of the respiration, especially slowing it down, and concentrating the attention on particular physiological centers or chakras. So they've got parallels there. In yoga, however, in your inner exploration, you go down below the level of the heart. But in the Orthodox Christian Hesychas tradition, you are told most strictly, do not extend your inner exploration below the heart. The consequences will be very undesirable. But I won't go into details. Um, It seems to me unlikely that the 14th century Hesychasts on Mount Athos knew much about yoga, but you never know. However, there may well have been some mutual influence with Sufism. In Sufism, you have Dikka, or Dikka, I can't pronounce Arabic, Dikka sometimes. Um, one pronunciation, but sometimes dhikar more. Yes. So, um, yes, I would spell it like that. But you could spell it with a Z. And this is the invocation of the name of Allah. And here, of course, in Sufism, the parallels are much closer. Because whereas yoga does not necessarily imply belief in a personal God, the Sufis definitely do believe in a personal God as Muslims, and they are definitely invoking the holy name of God. And the parallels are quite close. So it's not impossible that the Hesychasts were influenced by the Sufis, or vice versa. But as far as I know, nobody yet has established definite connections with specific evidence. This is all speculative. We don't know exactly, but there could have been interaction. After all, plenty of Christians went on pilgrimage to the holy places where they would have met Muslims, and the encounters were not necessarily hostile. They might well have talked to one another about the ways they prayed. St. Gregory Palamas himself uh, was taken prisoner at one point when as Archbishop of Thessalonica he was traveling uh, by boat back to Constantinople, he was, uh, the boat was seized by pirates and taken to Asia Minor and he remained in custody under the um, Turks for over a year before they got the ransom money together and he could go to Constantinople. And he had conversations with the local Muslim religious leaders uh, of which we have a record. Uh, and the conversations were carried on at quite a high level. They didn't insult each other. But in those conversations, the record we have, there's no discussion about methods of prayer. So it would have been perfectly possible for the Orthodox to know what the Sufis were up to, and vice versa. But we are, can only speculate. However, there are parallels elsewhere. Um, in the West, St. Ignatius Loyola, in the 16th century, recommends the, a breathing technique in his third method of prayer. He says that you can say the Lord's Prayer slowly and say one word at each breath. Yes, he says, the third method of prayer is that at each breath or respiration, prayer be made mentally, saying one word of the Lord's Prayer, or any other prayer that is being recited, so that only one word be said between each breath. And in the length of time between each breath, let the attention be specially paid to the signification 
of the word or to the person to whom the prayer is directed or to one's lowness or to the distance between that person's great dignity and such great lowness of ours. Then he will proceed in the same way and method through the remaining words of the Lord's Prayer. Now that's not exactly the same as the Jesus Prayer. But it's similar. The underlying principle is the same that a link is established here as in hesychasm between the words of prayer and the tempo of the respiration. So then, very interesting, the physical technique, but not essential, and what matters is to invoke the Lord Jesus with love and faith this you can do without any technique at all. Yes, we might have a short pause now to, for any questions you have before I go on to other aspects of the 14th century. Any comments? Yes. Now that's certainly an interesting theme um, because Yes, you have the great cathedral in Montmartre of the Sacre Coeur, the Holy Heart of Jesus. And this devotion to the heart of Jesus certainly goes back to the 16th century, and I suspect earlier. Yes, certainly earlier in the Middle Ages. Um, I would see the following difference that the Western devotion to the heart of Jesus is bound up with a spirituality that is strongly concentrated on the emotions, the affections, the feelings. Um, and therefore, the relationship to the holy heart of Jesus is something that one is to feel in a very strongly emotional manner. Some people think that orthodoxy is exuberant. I would say orthodox spirituality is rather sober. We stress sobriety, and I find a lot of Western spirituality much more emotional than uh, orthodox spirituality. And I think this is true of the sacred heart devotion. Already with people like Anselm, you begin to have a devotion to the humanity of Jesus that is based very strongly on the affections and feelings. And I think it is within this devotion to the sacred humanity that the devotion to the heart arises, the sacred heart of Jesus. Um, and I would also say of the invocation of the name in the medieval West that it also is more linked with an emotional spirituality centering on the human nature of Christ whereas the Eastern approach makes less use of the emotions and does not think of the humanity of Christ particularly but simply of Christ's total person so I see a difference in emphasis.